This is how it sounded July 1st, 1987. Take a listen. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first broadcast of WFAN All Sports 1050. You're sharing a part of radio history with us today. This is the beginning of the first 24-hour-a-day sports station. I'm Susan Waldman. Oh, Let's welcome aboard great. Susan Waldman right now. Good afternoon, Susan. How are you? Oh, good afternoon. I think that was the only update I ever did where I didn't make a mistake because I could actually write it down. <laughs> and don't, don't forget, back then, there's no computers. There's nothing. We went out and ripped and read. So <laughs> that was the one thing I got to practice. And then, yeah, it was a little different. Yeah. And the... the um, the beginning of that, or part that it was after that, was when I started the update. The sign on the message board says "Vintage Gidry," and if those of you who don't remember at the old stadium, um, they would have on the on the message boards the signs that were above the stadium, kind of a little recap of last night's game. And yeah, um, yeah, and that's what I remember, Vintage Gidry. So uh, <laughs> that was tremendous. What a day that was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Susan, do you remember how you felt right before you went on the air for the first time for WFN? I I do, Maggie, and this is kind of going to surprise you. It was very crowded. If anybody, the old stadium, uh, the old stadium, the old studio was in Astoria downstairs. Kaufman Astoria Studios was actually um, one of the first uh, movie studios ever. And uh, they have pictures of uh, Mary Pickford and all the silent movie people. that, And that's where they all made those movies back then before everybody went to Hollywood. So you saw that and you saw those pictures. And I walked in there and I'll tell you what I was thinking. Obviously, we were all very nervous. There were television cameras every everywhere. And Jeff Smullyan, who later bought the Seattle Mariners, was the owner of Emmis. And he was there and it was packed, packed. But on the other side of the glass where the control room was, everybody at WHN was standing in there. And they were holding hands and they were watching. And Maggie, I tell you that 30 seconds before that jingle went on the air, I looked in there and people were crying. And I thought, as soon as I open my mouth, they cease to exist. And it, it was such a stunning moment to me. I mean, we were all so excited. And there were these people in there that had been there forever and holding hands. And a lot of them were were crying. And it really is a feeling that as soon as I started to talk, WHN would cease to exist. It was odd. That's that's what I felt. Yeah, very. (laughs) Yeah, I can understand that. It's just so much pressure, Susan. I mean, were you feeling that at the time? I wasn't feeling that until the third or fourth update when I heard uh, somebody saying, get, it, get that smart, smart-ass um, broad off the air with the Boston accent in prime time. That's the first thing I heard <laughs> screaming on the other side of the door. Yeah, no, it didn't, it didn't go well for me early. Yeah, let's put it that way. Yeah, that was the – and Jim Lampley was the host. And um, it was because it was supposed to be Pete Franklin, and Pete had had a heart attack and did not come to the station for a few months. And they were having guest hosts. Jim Lampley did three. That's where I met John Sterling. John Sterling came in for a week, wow. a couple of weeks later. He was doing the doing – the, uh, the Braves, and it was All-Star break, whenever that was, maybe it was the next week, and he did a week of shows, that's where I met John, was him, I was doing his his updates, it was a very interesting time. <laughs> but you I know, don't want you, yeah, yeah, um, Certainly. I, no, always, I, I was curious, what led you to do what, what led you to the opportunity here at WFAN <laughs> to get to get that opportunity? All right, it was really simple, actually. Um, one of my best friends was um, I, I was in theater, obviously, and you know the music was changing, and the only other thing I really knew was sports, and I was always involved in sports since I was a tiny little girl. But you never think about any of that. And one of my best friends in the world was the late Ken Coleman, and he was the broadcaster for the Boston Red Sox, and we had a little business together, and I would always go to to games and I'd sing the anthem wherever I was just so I could get on the field and see the games. I did it, you know, that was before people knew it was a way to get on television. I just went because I want to go to the games. And I was always, yeah. you know, a sports person, always. And I just didn't have any place to put it. I used to, to write a lot and all those kinds of things. And Ken Coleman one day in 1980, early 1987 said to me, you got to meet 
this guy. His name is John Channon, and um, he did a thing called Enterprise Radio, which was out of Connecticut, and it was it was going to be a big national radio thing, and it didn't really work. But he's going to put together this thing, fan, F-A-N, something, in New York, and they want to do an all-sports radio station, and he's got to meet you. And so I called him up, and um, he said, well, I'd like to hear a tape of your sportscast. I said, oh, sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep, that's what I got. <laughs> and um, I called this friend of mine, and he worked at um, uh, CBS FM, and I, he did overnights. And I said, i got to put together a sports report. Can you do it back and forth with me? Because I'm sort of smart-alecky and all of that. And we did, and we, I got my little cassette. Everybody know what a cassette is? <laughs> I put in a little yeah. cassette, and at like 6 o'clock in the morning we did this and I went over to John Shannon's office and I put it on his desk and um, they hired me. That's amazing. <laughs> so, awesome. Yeah, that was, yeah, yeah. You know, Susan, w- when did you first realize that the fan had sort of broken through, you know, with like the consciousness of New York and that it was a thing, for lack of a better term? When did you realize the fan had connected with the city? See, I always thought it had connected with the city. I know it wasn't successful until I must got there, but I always thought it did because every place I went, and in those days, guys, um, when <laughs> you know they tried to they tried to fire me, but they couldn't, so they moved me to overnights with Steve Summers, which really backfired because then I became a, a person because Steve Summers taught me all kinds of things, and I'd sing the national anthem to truckers at four in the morning, and we'd really have great talks and things, and I owe a lot to Steve Summers for teaching me how to do this business. But um, one of the things that I suggested was getting rid of the people. This is really early. This was still in 87. Um, The then program director, John Pruder, um, I went to him and I said, you know, with having people like a Moss Klein or a Murray Chass or a Bill Madden on the air in the morning to tell you about Yankee games, they're never going to tell you anything good. They don't want to give you stuff before the papers. I said, give me a tape recorder. I'll drive. I'll go everywhere. And so we know that story. But what I saw, Maggie, every place I went, and I know I was going to, you know, to Yankee games and Met games and uh, Devil games and whatever, and Seton Hall and and St. John's. Um, Knicks. Knicks. Well, yeah, Knicks and Nets. And I did everything. I did everything. Driven my little car and, and then did overnights. And what I noticed was everyone knew what I had said the day before. So I never thought it was, I didn't know about the money thing. But I never thought it wasn't going to be successful because I knew what kind of sports fans are in this city. And once you had people just talking to New Yorkers, it was really going to work. You can't talk to people in New York like they live in Nebraska. I mean, nobody cares about Nebraska football in New York. I mean, it's, it, was, it was those kinds of things that I thought, if, boy, if we could just get it, just focus it right into New York. I thought it was going to be successful the whole time. I really did. And Susan, growing up listening to the station, and and you did a wonderful job covering all those teams. I, I loved it when you were covering the Knicks as well. I mean, Me those too. were Me too. those were. I mean, those were fun days. They were good days. I mean, talking about John Starks before he made the team, how the team felt about Starks and what he could potentially be for the team. I mean, those were good Nick days. You know what? And even before that, you know how I got the Knicks because um, the the year 80, uh, 90, 87, um, nobody we were going to go to do, you know, cover, cover the Knicks. Well, the Knicks had um, won 24 games the year before, and they hired this coach that no one in New York had ever heard of named Rick Pitino. Yeah. I knew Pitino from BU when he had the kids running up and down the court with bricks <laughs> in their hands because they, they weren't in shape, and obviously I know what he did in Providence, and they practiced out here in Westchester, and the guy said, I'm not going to Westchester, and I said, I'll go. And that's how I got the Knicks. And that was that was fabulous because I did know Patrick since he was like 15 because he went to school and uh, he went to high school in Boston. So we, I was very aware of him and um, his mom and all those kinds of things. And that was how, you know, those days were really fun. You know why? We traveled on commercial tr- planes with the team. So That's you're crazy. sitting in an airport, and there's the Celtics coming in as you're going out, or, or you know, they, you cross a different path, and there's only there were only twelve of them, and you'd sit, and they have to sit with people, and they have to talk to people, and they talk to me, and you'd sit there, and you'd be all together. The uh, the um, back then, before there were charters, Mike Saunders, who was the the um, the trainer, would get your ticket, and we'd all go, 
<laughs> go to Sudi Purchase or where we were, and they'd pass out the tickets, and you'd get on the plane. And it was it was a different different time. I loved those days. I loved the whole thing um, until you know, till obviously uh, the '90s when I went Yankees full time. But those were great, great. Great, great years, and you mentioned John Stocks, who might be Stocks, who still might be one of my favorite people I've ever met in my whole life. You know, Susan Waldman is our guest, and and you know, Susan, two things that you kind of said while answering that question that I think is really important for anyone listening who wants to be a broadcaster, which is always say yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, we got to say yes. Like if someone yep. asks you to do something, you know, you got to say yes to those opportunities. And the second one is you never know who you're going to come back around and encounter, right? You knew Patrick Ewing when he was 15. You knew Rick Pitino from BU, from Providence. You never know. It's a People think sports is this really big world. It's not. It's this it's really not. small it world. It absolutely is not. One of the things I say all the time when people um, – walk in I said you know if you wait long enough everyone walks in through that Yankee clubhouse door the other thing is that I always say is you make yourself indispensable I also did all the home games for the Devils so when they got into the playoffs and Brandon Shanahan was just a rookie that year when they got into the playoffs the first time they FAN had to send me because I was the only one who knew the team and that was you know so you make yourself indispensable and oh I'll go okay yeah and that's what that's what you did. I mean, I became friends with PJ Carlismo when he was at Seton Hall. You know, now he comes when he's in town, comes and sits in the booth. It's it, it's such a small world, and I think people forget that it really is because it's a small group, and they do keep coming back over and over and over. If you stay in it long enough, you know everybody in the business. Mm-hmm. You know, true, very very true, Susan. What, the Yankees, you know, if obviously Georgia has passed away a number of years ago. Mm-hmm. Your your relationship with Georgia, someone comes up to you, Susan, and asks you, you know, they've read books, they've heard stories, you know, how would you describe George Steinbrenner uh, based on your experience about what he was as Yankee owner? Well, from my experience personally, only my mother and my grandfather were more important in my life than George Steinbrenner. And that is, um, and I was on the other end of those screaming phone calls too, but um, he was loyal. He was mercurial. I'll tell you a great story. You never knew what was going to get what George upset. And I guess everybody's heard the story of how I got, you know, I was not included in a luncheon and I flew to Tampa and and insisted on talking to him. That's how we became friends because I went down there and um, he, (laughs) he was mercurial. So you never knew what was going to get him mad. I'd say something on FAN. I'd have a Yankee report. I'd maybe 10 in the morning and 5 in the afternoon. I'm not sure. And I'd say something. And I'd say, oh, my God. Oh, God, he's going <laughs> to scream at me. And, and he never did. But one day I said something. We were in Seattle, and the bus was late. And I said something. I'm sorry. The bus is late or whatever. He called me and screamed at me, Waldman, you're cut off. Don't you ever tell people about our bus times. <laughs> and he hung the phone. Sl- in those days, you could slam the phone down like I used to do to Russo. It was yeah. very dramatic. <laughs> I mean, those were, you know, you just, it was so dramatic back then. None of this cell phone garbage. You had a phone. All right, that's it. Slam. And it was very effective. And, so, but we would do that. And um, he, was, he was loyal. I still, guys, um, have fans coming up to me and said, Susan, I don't know who to thank, but since you're here, um, Mr. Steinbrenner put my father through college, and I don't know who to thank. Wow. Um, you know, he would send kids of, and never tell anybody, kids of policemen and firemen. And college, Tony Fossis, who was a left-handed pitcher for both the Yankees and the Red Sox, came up to me one day at the end of his career and said, I think George put me through FS, I think it's FSU, one of the Florida schools, because he had programs that if you had good grades and you were an athlete, as long as you kept your grades up and were on some team or whatever, he'd pay for your college. And he never took a thank you. And he said, can you find out? And I went to George, and George didn't like to be recognized for this stuff. And I said, Tony Fossis um, you know, asked me, and he said, I remember him saying to me, Susan, what's the highest form of, of anonymity? And I said, of, I mean, of, of charity. I said, no, anonymity is the highest form of charity. And he'd say, it's in your Bible, Waldman. It's in your <laughs> Bible. And, and I said, but he just wants to thank thank you and he's standing outside <laughs> so so he did he, he shook his hand but he never liked to get recognized for that he he 
he was a very fascinating man. And, and trust me, I know the other side of it, too. I was on it many times. Um, you know, but he did, uh, for example, 1990, whatever it was, when he was suspended, he called me up and he said, uh, is your father still alive? And I said, yeah. And he said, what's their address? And he, and he slammed the phone down. And two <laughs> days later, my father got in the mail George's tickets to Fenway Park um, because owners get tickets and he couldn't go because he couldn't go to any parks. And he sent two tickets to my father so that That's he could great. go see the wow. Red Sox play Oakland. I mean, it's, it's stunning the things that he would do. You know, it's just what what's so hard sometimes, I think, for people who had no relationship with him to square, Susan, is how much he craved the attention and everything else and how much he used the press and back pages to get points across. And, and so it's like this weird yin and yang of him when you hear stories like that, someone who was so public-facing and who used the media it, to his advantage and then someone who wanted no credit whatsoever when he was right. doing uh, nice well, things. And so that's Well, he a, wanted no credit for things that he thought were important. You know, those kinds of things are important to him. I mean, uh, charity and putting kids through school and moving. He was also, he, he was a showman. He was really a showman, and he lo- of course he loved the attention. Of course he did. You know, if, you're, if you don't own a team, you're just another rich billionaire. I mean, and there's thousands, yeah. millions of them. But he, he loved this, but I, I do I want every, I mean, everybody does know that George, sometimes his ideas were a little wrong, like when he decided that the Yankees should be ru- a running team, and they all showed up one year with track suits, and he had Harrison Dillard teaching <laughs> teaching them. Luke Pinella talks about this all the time. And he was going to make them running because Toronto ran and they were winning more games. I mean, he did everything for the team, never took money out of the team, did everything to develop. All he wanted to do was win. He really did. And some of his ways were a little, maybe I wouldn't have done it that way. And obviously it's not being done like that now. But um, he was... He just he just loved it. He loved it, and he loved his team. And you know, and I, his heart was always in the right place. I think some of his actions were not, not not the best. But I think that um, if you stood up to George, I mean, how many? I heard a million times. All right, go ahead, but this better work. And I've heard that. And, and you know, and he said it. All right. It's your head. A million times he said that to Brian Cashman. All right, yeah. we'll do it your way to stick Michael, but it better work. So if you talk to him, he would come around or he'd let you try things. And, you know, he was, um, you know, everybody has stories about, about George. We'll never see his like again. I miss him every day. Moose and Maggie with you here on this Wednesday midday, the anniversary, the July 1st, 1987 WFAN launch. We're talking about uh, talking to the legendary voice of WFAN, Susan Waldman, Yankees broadcaster, obviously, partner of John Sterling, Yankee baseball right around the corner, Susan. How are you going to look at this season? You know, 60-game sprint, not a 162-game marathon. We've heard that. You know, the, the team is loaded with Garrett Cole. Good news from Cashman yesterday when he addressed the media. Yeah. Boone's going to address the media later on this afternoon. How do you look at this Yankee season? as it gets going later on this month. I wish I could look at that season as I wish I could look at this baseball season without the other things that are going on um, sure. about it. I mean, every I really can't. I can't look at it. I mean, the whole thing to me is I understand why they're trying. I think it's a mistake. Um, but I, I don't I don't know. I can't look at it um, as anything except, you know, they want to get something going and I think they're, maybe their hearts are in the right places. I'm not sure. But I can't look at it like that. And by the way, um, you couldn't be more wrong about Garrett Cole. He is not cantankerous. He is none of those things. He's a delight. He already is a leader in that in that clubhouse, and I think he's going to be fabulous. He's waited his whole life to be a Yankee, and you could see it. And that whole thing with the with the World Series, what you didn't put on the end of that sentence was that he actually did come out and talk. It was kind of a which happens a lot. He's he's something very very special. I would be surprised if he's not magnificent here. I don't know about this year. I don't know about anything this year. I'm putting my money, I think, on the Tampa Bay Rays because they always start so so hot and it's a sprint not a marathon and they're built for these kinds of games um you know i heard you guys talking about aaron judge and the launch angle and all that well if you're going to do that and you're going to do it for 60 games you're going to lose some games because um, people are not going to play like that. You can go right from the you're, – you're not going to have starters going five, six, seven innings. You're going to have starters going three innings and four innings, and then you trot in that bullpen. But if you've got a shot at scoring a run, you better not sit there and wait for your pitch. You better go and score that run. That's why I kind of think somebody like Tyler Wade um, would be great on this team. You know, even if it, in extra innings, do you start him on second base, move the runner around, or do you start someone else on second base and put Tyler 
Tyler Wade up there because he's one of two people on this team who can actually bunt and move people around that way. They better think of other ways to win and not just sit back and wait for balls to go in the stands because I think that is not going to happen this year. But that's been the mindset here and the, really what baseball has, has leaned into. You think they're going to see a complete opposite approach here across the sport, Susan? I, I don't know that. But I do know that the teams that have won in the last couple of years, the Nationals did not sit back and, and wait to hit the ball out of the, out of the park. Sure. A couple of years ago when the Red Sox won, they did not sit back and wait um, for the ball to be out of the park. How many times did we see Mookie get a double and move him around? And there you go. It's one to yeah. nothing in the first <laughs> inning. And that's what I, I think. You know, I could be wrong. Nobody really knows. And nobody knows if this is going to happen either. Um, I, I only bring up Tampa Bay. Bay, I'm thinking of a lot of, you know, we're not going down the Orioles route, but Tampa Bay, teams like that, that um, it was a great, he was a scout when I met him, his name was Dom Cheedy, and he was, a, he was a coach for many, many years, and Dom used to say, when teams would get off to great starts, he'd say to me, don't ever forget, um, boys play early, men play late. Well, there isn't going to be any late, so everybody is going to play early. And look at the teams that know how to score runs. I, I really think that you, you better start thinking of scoring runs. One of the things Aaron Boone tried to do last year actually wanted, talked about taking advantage of, of base runners, moving people around. Of course, it's easier to hit a three-run home run than get five hits in a row off of Justin Verlander. But you better do a little bit more this year because, you know, you're going to go right from – you're not going to see those number five starters, I don't think. I really don't. I think you're going to do – you've got a long bullpen. You're going to have the extra men are all going to be arms – and, you know, the Yankees have a slew of them, by the way. And don't, you know, don't uh, not look at some of these kids that are going to be in camp, like a Michael King and a Clark Schmidt. And I think Nick Nelson is also in camp. There's a bunch of them, Davey Garcia. Uh, they could come in, do an inning. You can keep going that way, you know, pitch an inning, pitch an inning until your starters get all worked up. It's going to be very interesting if it gets going and if everybody stays healthy and there's no more problems. I, what, I, what I kind of don't like is that I think everybody thinks this is in a vacuum and we're supposed to talk about baseball um, like it's any other season, and it's just not. Yeah, Susan, uh, how, I mean, listen, you've been traveling with the team for all these years. How big of a challenge do you think it's going to be for everyone to stay disciplined and keep their eye on the prize here of trying to finish out the season once they go home to their families and, and, and the fact that, you know, baseball is not attempting to do this in a bubble. They're going to go and travel and be in home ballparks. Well, some people are going to be, are going to be traveling. I don't, I don't know. I would hope that, um, that there would be some discipline. I think um, older players who have families are going to be very, it's going to be easy to do, but I think there is an attitude of, among young people and we've seen it in this country and baseball players are no different than, than other people their age, 25 or whatever they are a lot of people don't take this seriously you know and I wish I could explain to them you know you get this and stand next to me I get it and I'm at terrible risk you know people that are older and I I wish I I hope everyone's going to take it seriously I hope they do there are people around the Yankees we won't be anywhere near them near the players which is going to be really difficult for baseball because the part of baseball that is so wonderful besides the games themselves is that people getting to know players and if if writers aren't there and broadcasters aren't there I mean I spend three hours a day in each you know in both clubhouses to find out stories about people that's gone and if the you know, this isn't football where you just watch the game, this is baseball where stories are are told and how are they feeling and all those kinds of things. It's very very personal, and that's going to be tough. And I hope everybody can do this so that we can get through the the season. I I respect um, the people that are that are opting out for the reasons. I don't know um, Ian Desmond. I wish I did. He's unbelievable, evidently. But a lot of the the things that I'm reading, I understand it. I really understand it. And and you know, hopefully they'll get through this and no one will get sick or worse. You think it's a massive mistake, Susan? I don't think it's – I think it's risky. I think yeah. it really is. But, you know, they came too far down that, that line to go back. Um, yeah, I just wonder what would have happened had they not had this big public fight and said, you know, this is just too risky. We'd love to do this, but we'll make it next year bigger and better than ever, ever and all that. I don't know. I don't know. I hope I'm – I really hope I'm wrong. You know, but I – you know, look at it through the eyes of an older person. And, and it's, it's kind of scary. It's really scary. 
Just a couple more for you, Susan Waldman sure. joining us, and, and so happy to have you, Susan. And you know, I've said this to you before, but without you being on the fan, I'm not on the fan, <laughs> and I know that. And and there are so many women who are oh, in radio you. now, and it's because of pioneers like yourself. Um, to the Yankees individually, who do you think is feeling the pressure for this season to really perform? Obviously, it's a wonky season; it's going to be odd. But who do you think individually is feeling a lot of pressure going into 2020? I don't think anybody is. I really don't. I just from the way they are, there's no, why, why is there pressure? The only thing is, I mean, so James Paxton is in his walk year. DJ LeMayhew is in his walk year, I guess. If you don't know what DJ LeMayhew and James Paxton are by now, shame on you. I don't think anybody is feeling, I don't, I don't think there's a, there's a panic or a, or a pressure to, uh, look, you play in New York, there's a pressure to win. There always is. I just don't, I think this is a gift. I really think this season is a gift. And if you look at what happens this year and really say, boy, this is, you know, a manager's going to get fired because he, he didn't win the World Series, I, know, I think you better take it as this is a gift to you. If we get through it and there's baseball that I can talk about and we all can watch and enjoy and smile at something, I think you've won. I don't think there's any pressure on anybody in there. I really don't. I might be wrong, but I don't think I am. So if the Yankees if the Yankees don't do well this year, Susan, you what don't do you think mean do well. What they does don't that make the mean? playoffs. Get eliminated in the first round of the playoffs. Who? Well, what make the playoffs or get eliminated? In the, see, well, either way, if, I mean, if they okay. don't make the playoffs, it's it's a disaster. I mean, you know, it's if, not a disaster. What are you talking about, it's Susan? Like you a, play sixty games. The Yankees are loaded. I mean, there's there's not a weakness on the team. You geez, know this, Susan? Where, yeah, they are no, they are loaded. Oh, they sure just they added are. Garrett Cole in the off season. Oh, yeah. They got sixty games to play. We we get over this global pandemic. You play these games. There's really nothing in the Yankees' way wait, not wait, to be a playoff team this year. This global pandemic no no with this global pandemic if okay. if we if it doesn't end the season and we play 60 games mm-hmm. this year there's no reason why the Yankees are not a playoff team. Yeah, well, I would think, except there's other teams in that league. There's the <laughs> Washington Nationals, and there's the Atlanta Braves, and yes. there's the Philadelphia Phillies, and there's the Boston Red Sox, and don't sleep on the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, there's a lot of – I just think if you want to put this through the prism of regular sports, go ahead. I'm not. I mean, and if you are, I think it's a real mistake. This should be joy. That's all there. And if there's no reason why they shouldn't win, I mean, there really isn't. They got arms coming out of the walls. They got so many arms. They can do that. And they have a really great team. So does Washington. So does Philly. Even the Mets are in that with that pitching staff and different people that they've got. What if Cespedes comes back and hits 40 home runs in 60 games? I don't know. Well, that would be unbelievable if he did well, that. But 40. It, my my whole thing, and maybe I can do that because I'm not. I don't have a talk show every day and listen to fans and things. Um, um, but I just think that if we get through this, it is a gift and should take it as yeah. sports. Try and enjoy it. And if the Yankees win, fine. If they don't, trust me, no one's getting fired. And you guys oh. want to yell about it? That's fine. Nobody's no, I don't think anyone's. Fired. Susan, I don't think anyone's getting fired. But we're <laughs> we're playing the games for a reason. I'm happy baseball is back. Why are we I'm hoping the games, that the season Mark. gets played. Mark, but we're, yeah. Why are we playing the games? We're playing the games because they want to get to the postseason. They want the money. Bing, 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 bing. Yeah, I understand. I understand why they're, they're playing the games. I get it. And, and, baseball, and Su- baseball is a game of attrition. That's why I've been screaming for years about September and getting rid of those players. Baseball is a game of attrition. Agreed. And, that's, and the, the, the teams that win are always the teams that are left standing at the end of, end of um, 162 games or whatever it is. So when you win the World Series going through three rounds of playoffs, you've really done something. I mean, if, I don't think it's the same. I mean, I'm sure that, I'm sure that that's not what Aaron Boone is saying to his, his team. This is my opinion. And, um, you know, it'd be great. I don't, you know, I don't like teams losing. I certainly don't like to broadcast. I want the Yankees to win a World teams. Series this year, Susan. Well, I but see, that's the point of it, right? Say I mean, that's the Yankees it. win. It, is it going to feel like it should be 28? Yeah. Or something else? They'll celebrate like it's twenty eight. I'll tell you that. Well, of course, well, because, I mean, well, because it's hard to. It'll be it'll be harder anyway because there's so many teams in that East that you know can be can be a problem. I mean, Miami might not have hitting, but they do have pitching coming up, and I don't know what they're going to do. I think it's just going to be very very different. I don't think you can put. Although I had an argument with somebody about that because I totally forgot 
that I know the Dodger Yankees in, in 81. I totally forgot for a while that there was a split season and, and it wasn't a real season, but they did play a, a lot of games um, coming back after that. Um, it'll be interesting. I don't think it's like a real season. I'm glad they're having it. If the Yankees win, it's great. If they don't, I don't think, you know, I don't think there's going to be much consternation about that. They're going to have to start um, figuring out what to, to do for next year. Yeah, they're going to have to start to do that. Uh, Susan, what um, A-Rod, I want to ask you one about A-Rod, his pursuit here of the Mets with Jennifer Lopez. They've got Rapoli, <laughs> Vinny Viola involved. Yeah. They're one of the, there's seven groups that have been pre-approved here by Major League Baseball. Uh, bids are going to come this month. Right. The Mets are selling that team. What about yeah. the the bid by A-Rod to, oh, to try and own the Mets? You, don't you wish it happens? Oh, I'm praying. I will pray. <laughs> I mean, is, would that be just joy? Talk about joy. Talk about <laughs> something to talk about and and by the way they've got a whole plan and not just you know a lot of people alex is friends with people like bob Kraft and knows what you know look what bob Kraft did with the patriots that's a city in there that that's is. not just you know <laughs> a football stadium i just think to have the two of them and they'd be involved too i mean they wouldn't just do it and wander around oh no alex would <laughs> oh i think it would be heaven and i might go back and get a talk show just to be on the air if alex and jay will have that you I can't even imagine we'll, how it's... We got it's... a chair for you. Oh, <laughs> gosh. Would, you. Wouldn't that be exciting? Oh, oh it would it'd be, be crazy. amazing. Susan, he's going to be out on the field hitting fungos I know the he game. Is. He's going to be like Jerry Jones times 20. Well, but he can actually play. So actually, right. you know, he know, he's yeah. got great ideas. Don't have a, you know, I said, don't sleep on Alex. And by the way, she's smarter than he is. Uh, they're <laughs> fascinating, fascinating people. We always people. are. <laughs> by, uh, well, she's just think about, just think about this, Maggie. She's now 50 and she has reinvented herself maybe five times and stayed on top every time. You know how yeah. hard that is to do for a female? Oh, and she's she's the uh, triple threat, she's, you know. She's she can awesome. Act, she can she's sing, she awesome can dance, in yeah. every way and real and nice, yeah, very, very smart. Very, very smart. I hope so. I mean, I'm just going to start operation. lighting a candle now. That would, <laughs> Oh, gosh, would it be great. Oh, I can't even imagine how great that would be. Hey, Susan, uh, we appreciate the time. Um, good chatting with you. And uh, and thanks for the time this afternoon. Reminiscing. Thanks for asking me. Thanks. For- of course. Thanks, Susan. You okay, happy you anniversary, that. FAN. That's it. The first it's voice of WFAN, day. Susan Waldman, July 1st, 1987. And always good to talk a little baseball with Susan. Moose and I are going to take a quick timeout. Uh, we touched on something there. Whether it's a disappointment if the Yankees don't make the postseason or whether they get, would get ousted in the first round, should you look at it? As Susan said, just pure joy. Just look at the season as a gift oh and that there's no expectations or are there what massive are we, expectations? What are we exactly – so then after a bad Yankee loss, we're going to come on the airways at 10 a.m. and just be like, what? Baseball's back. 